just give a few seconds. Just waiting for the video to come online. Okay, there you go. All right. Okay, Pat, I'm ready to go with your introduction. So good afternoon and welcome to our participants in this session. Today, our guest speaker is James Patrick Clark, otherwise best known as Pat Clark within the Formula student community. While Pat does not need any formal introduction for himself, a few notes would bring new members in the community up to speed. Pat currently joins us from Sydney, Australia. He officially retired in 2016, although he keeps himself busier than most. He's a guest lecturer at the University of Technology in Sydney and is a tech editor of an Australian motorsport magazine. He frequently he frequents several international Formula Student events each year in roles as a design judge and as a mentor at Pat's Corner. Pat entered the Formula Student uh, arena through his passion for bringing education into motorsport, apart from the racing aspect. In 1994, while traveling to the USA on business, he attended the Formula SAE competition there as a visitor. In 1996, he attended as a volunteer, and so is history. With more than 25 years in Formula Student, Pat joins us today to provide advice for teams with a limited budget to become successful in Formula Student. Without further ado, please welcome Pat Clark to today's topic within the Formula Bharat Academy series. Pat, you can go ahead. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you all the viewers who've come to listen to Pat's words of wisdom. Um, as Kathy said, uh, I've been involved now with about 60 events. And one thing that I've noticed is a, an upward creep of the technology. Um, and that is reflected often in the presentations that are done by, by guests such as myself. But you realize that you know, teams have to start off somewhere and many of them don't have much money. So this time what we've decided to do, or what I've decided to do is to do just a simple presentation to try help uh, teams uh, enter Formula Barat or Formula Student with a uh, with a project that you know it's probably not going to be particularly competitive in the dynamic events, but it will allow them to to take advantage of all the educational opportunities that uh, that Formula Student offers. Formula Student was started off not as a um, as a as a motorsport event, but as an educational event. Um, the motorsport aspect of Formula Student is the theme that we run because obviously it's got to uh, it's got to be exciting, it's got to be interesting, and uh, I don't think there's a young man on the planet who doesn't like fast cars or whatever, and uh, you know, so uh, that's that's the theme. Uh, however, it's it's not a uh, it's not a mini Formula One uh, project that we're doing despite the fact that some, uh, some events and some teams take it so seriously that they almost are at Formula One standard. Uh, however, when you're, uh, when you're dealing with a third world country where uh, uh, you know, money and uh, sponsors are difficult to attain, where experience is difficult to attain, um, a little bit of a helping hand and a little bit of an understanding of, uh, of the difficulties that those teams work under it is, is important. Um, I come to India every year. Uh, I was there in January this year. Uh, and so I'm, I'm fully aware of, of what's, you know, what, what, what problems you, you face. So um, I'm a great believer in rules of three. Um, and the three things that you need to have a successful formula team is uh, we need people. Now, in India, you're never going to have a problem with people. <laughs> there are more than enough people. And in fact, the problem could well be that you have too many people. Um, often, uh, you'll end up with, uh, with people on the team who are really only there basically for the ride. They just want to be part of the excitement. And they're, and they're not they're not contributing. So, I I say, you know, compare it to a beehive. Um, in a beehive, you have a leader, the, the queen. You have the workers, and then you've got the drones. 
Well, unfortunately, you can have drones in a formula team too. So do like the bees do, throw them out. Either convert them to workers or throw them out. They're really not helping you, they just get in the way. Um, be careful though, some of those drones might actually be your team leaders or your workers for next year's event or the year after, in which case they certainly should be allowed to hang on around, like be groupies that hang around the group. Okay, um, the second thing that you need is money. Now, no formula student team ever in the world had enough money, and that includes the wealthy Germans with their multi-thousand dollar teams. Uh, there's always, you always can use more money. Uh, I will talk a little about raising money. Uh, there are some tricks, shall we say. Uh, but one thing that you shouldn't be doing is just uh, sending out emails and, and letters asking for sponsorship because th that, just, that just doesn't work. Um, I'll talk about that a little later on in the presentation. Now, the third thing that you need is time. Um, Formula Student is primarily a project management exercise. Uh, you can get more people, you can get more money, but you cannot get more time. So managing the project and meeting your milestones, uh, being able to get your design finished, get your car built, get your car tested, get your drivers trained is of critical importance. Uh, more important than anything else. And time management is probably the best lesson that you learn from formula that you will take into a life in industry when you graduate and, and join the workforce. There is no more time. What's the old saying? Uh, nine women cannot make a baby in one month. Uh, you know, it takes nine months. Okay. Today, I'm going to talk about money. So we'll, miss, we'll talk about uh, project management maybe another time. But today, I'm going to talk about money or the lack of it. Regularly, I hear we're just a poor Indian team and we have no money. Now, I don't really accept that, but it is a situation that exists. Um, the reason you have no money is because you haven't found out how to raise it. As I mentioned, Formula Student is a training or an educational project to prepare you for a life after university when you, when you end up in the workforce. And you'll find that always any project that you ever are involved in anywhere, the first problem is raising the budget. So you need to learn how to do that. Um, your first team meeting, um, accepting that the team doesn't have uh, a, a big budget. You know, you certainly do need some money. If you can't have some sort of a realistic budget to do this, you really should be reassessing whether whether you should actually be trying to uh, trying to build a Formula student car and compete or not. And time out for a second. If you have to make that decision, if you decide that no, we can't do that, what I want you to do is to immediately contact uh, Formula Barat and volunteer as helpers, assistants, um, because we always need more people. And when you do that and attend the event, you will meet the judges and the organizers and you'll see what other teams are doing. Uh, you will learn a lot from it and uh, be better prepared for next year. Okay. Having assembled your first team, your first order of business should be to set your priorities. Oops, I've gone backwards one. Um, now, you must be realistic, okay? Bluntly, a new team with a small budget is not going to win Formula Barat. It just isn't gonna happen. Okay, here we have the situation with, with teams. I thought, actually thought this slide was somewhere else, but. It's always been this way, that you always had leaders, workers, and then you got the drones, the guys who are just along for the drive. That's, as I said, just fun, a 1924 Formula Barat car. Okay. You need to set your goals. 
you know, what, what are your goals? Do you want to just compete and have fun? Uh, that's maybe not the intent of, of formula. It, it should be taken as a serious, uh, serious effort to, to actually extend your education. Secondly, do you want to compete in a respectable manner? Yeah, regardless of what your other aspirations are doing, that you should aim to do. Do you want to complete the event? That's a nice thing to aim for, but unfortunately, more than 50% of the teams generally don't do that. For whatever reason, they, they have difficulty passing tech or they have reliability issues or their driver makes a mistake when they get on track. Um, and as a result, they don't finish the event. So it's a, a good goal to, to just complete the event. Uh, to be competitive in some static events. Now, this is something that a new team can work very hard at. You're not going to have the drivers. You're not going to have the ability to race on track with the fast guys. But you can work on your presentations, your cost event, your design event, uh, defend your design, um, your presentation event. You, you can win those. We regularly see new teams who come with a fresh idea and, and the right attitude actually doing very well in the static events. Fifth option is your goal to be competitive in some dynamic events. Got bad news for you. That isn't going to happen. Sixth, to win a static event. That could happen. That certainly could happen. Seventh, to win a dynamic event, not going to happen. Eighth, to win the event overall, well, unfortunately, that's in your dreams. But you must set your goals and you must have, uh, you know, you must have uh, realistic goals. However, you also need to set your goals to a level where, where you're stretched. What I really hate is when I see a team who've set themselves an easy target and then they miss it. You know, like a, for instance, a, a formula student car should weigh, let's say 250 kilograms. And the team set a goal for a 300 kilogram car. In other words, they've set a very soft, easy goal for themselves. And then we put it on the scales and it weighs 363 kilograms. Like that's really disappointing that you know, an, an easy goal has been set and they've missed it by a mile. Of course, then we talk about why did you miss it? That's, that's part of the judging that goes on at the event. Um, okay. Accepting that for whatever reason, the team have a limited budget, where the decisions are made, the team must accept the inevitable effect that this is going to have on their level of competitiveness. And we'll discuss that. Design decisions. The first thing, do. Do build a simple space frame car. You know, don't even consider building a, uh, uh, you know, a monocoque, carbon fiber, whatever. Just build a simple space frame car. There are reasons why I say to do that, other than the fact that it's it's much easier than a, than a, a, a monocoque car. One is, that a space frame car teaches the young engineers about load paths. When you put a force into the car from the engine or the suspension or the driver putting the brakes on, the, the engineers are able to see where that force goes and where that force is reacted and put tubes in appropriate to react those forces into the chassis. So it's an excellent training. Second thing about a space frame car is that if you cock up and you will, reach for the hacksaw, some new tube, cut the piece out and redo it. You can't do that with a, with a carbon composite car, it just doesn't happen. Okay, second thing I say is use the wheels from a street car with 12 or 13 inch tires. Um, there currently is a, a, a fashion, shall we say, in, um, in formula to run 10 inch wheels. Uh, but realistically for a new team who are budget stressed, forget about running 10 inch wheels because that makes the technical solutions very difficult. It's very difficult to get a brake package and a suspension package working around a 10 inch wheel. I say use wheels from a streetcar. That means just use ordinary steel wheels. Do not use uh, alloy wheels from a road car or alloy wheels like uh, uh, 
accessory aftermarket alloy wheels. Uh, they're unbelievably heavy. You know, I have a Subaru SUV parked outside and I had to change a tire on it the other day. And I nearly died when I realized how heavy the alloy wheel and tire actually was. Uh, the steel wheel is stiff, easy to work with, much lighter. Okay, it doesn't look tricky, but this isn't about looking trick. This is about getting your project done and finished and, uh, and you know, competing because you must get this car finished early. You must get this car tested because it's going to break. You're going to have to fix it. And just as important, you need to train your drivers how to drive it. Okay, use an easily available motorcycle engine up to 700 cc's. Doesn't matter what the engine is. And then you have to have a rigid timetable that is not adjustable. You know, there is no more time. You know, time all the time you've got, so all the time you've got. Okay, so we'll discuss these things in. Okay, simple space frame chassis. Okay, firstly, think about what the chassis actually is. It's just a fancy bracket that connects all the bits of the car together with sufficient stiffness. Now, like any bracket, it should be light and uncomplicated as possible. You, know, you don't want overcomplicated, heavy, horrible brackets. That means that you need to know what bits you want to connect together before you design the chassis. One of the most common design mistakes that we see is when a team start to design the chassis before they design anything else and then everything else gets adapted to it and um, you end up with a heavy, ugly, not very successful car that's run over time and you've missed your missed your um, your mile posts. Okay. The chassis has to react the forces that you feed into it. So we we'll talk about Isaac Newton's three laws. I say Isaac Newton is arguably the greatest race car engineer in history, even though the man never ever saw a race car. But you have to take heed of what he told us. Like Newton's three laws simply were, the first one is that a body at rest will remain at rest and a body in motion will remain in motion unless it's acted on by an external force. Now, how does that relate to your Formula student car? Well, it's going to sit there on the track looking at you unless you do something to put it into motion. And once it starts going into motion, it's going to just keep traveling in a straight line unless you do something to either slow it down or make it turn. So you need to apply other forces. Now those forces have to be fed into the chassis or should fit into the car and they have to be reacted because uh, um, there's another law that we're coming about every action having an equal and opposite reaction. You don't want to push on a simple flexi bracket when you try to steer the car. That means that your steering box moves in the chassis rather than the wheels turn on the car. Okay, the reason I've drawn at the bottom a pool cue, a snooker cue, and a cue ball is because we'll come back to that later. Okay, the second law is the force acting on an object. Oops, go on. The force acting on an object is equal to the mass of that object and its acceleration. This is universally known as F equals MA. F equals MA is the equation that gives you all you need to know about making a successful race car. If you want to increase the A, the acceleration, and that's not just acceleration in a straight line, but lateral acceleration, uh, uh, rotational acceleration, all the other accelerations, you need to either do one of two things. You need to increase the F or decrease the M. Now the forces come from the contact patch between the tire and the road. The M is the mass of what you're trying to steer around the track. If you're gonna make a decision to use road tires on this car, your F is going to be very low. So to have a reasonable performance in a straight line and around the corners, you need to decrease, work on decreasing the M as much as you can. And the only successful way to decrease the M 
is not to put it in there in the first place. So you shouldn't actually be putting anything in the car or anything on the car that doesn't need to be there. And if you're really clever, you might well find that you can make one bracket do two or three jobs and so have to have less complication in, in designing and making your chassis to start with. So that's, as I said, you're, you're, going to be, you're going to be limited with your F. So to have acceptable performance or, or excellent performance, definitely the M has to be reduced. Okay. The third one, of course, is that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You know, you fire that shotgun and it pushes back. You steer that car and it pushes back. You drop the clutch to accelerate. The wheels push forward, but the inertia of the car wants to push back. So all those forces have to be reacted. They have to go somewhere. And um, if you have a poor design solution, you'll have compliance. Uh, in other words, the the chassis will be flexible or, or, or not react the forces. So now we're starting to talk about needing a stiff chassis. And there is a difference between stiffness and strength. And there's also a difference between stiffness and weight. A clever, good design is stiff without any excess weight and without any excess bulk or excess material. That's the reason why the chassis design must come first. Okay. We'll revisit the third law. The, let's talk about these forces. Have a look at my cue. Now I've got a curved cue. Is there anybody out there who would actually play snooker or pool with a cue like that? Of course you wouldn't, because forces like to travel in a straight line. They don't like to go around corners, because as soon as you start to put forces around corners, what happens is you have compliance at the curves, which means you lose accuracy where the ball's going. But also, if you applied, say, a 10 Newton force to the queue up here, you're not going to get 10 Newtons here because some of that energy has actually been wasted in flexing the queue. The lesson that you have to learn from this on your, on your formula car is that apply the forces in straight lines. Don't send forces around corners. Now, it's not possible to do that. The forces must go around corners. So what you now need to do is to identify where you're going to change the direction of a force and make sure that the structure that you're designing and building is going to be stiff and able to, to, to react those forces in, in an acceptable way. You're always going to have some compliance. That, that, that's always the way. But you need compliance is your, is your enemy. And particularly in some areas that I'll talk about when we get along a little later. Some places it's maybe not that important. Some places it's critically important. Okay. So if we were to keep these force lines that are properly called load path straight, we need to understand the magnitude and direction of these forces. This means, as I said before, the actual chassis design comes very late in the design process. So don't do this. We see that a lot. Chalk marks on the floor, laying out some tubes. In this case, the, the team have laid out some uh, electrical conduit to try to lay out a chassis. Like this is step one in a disaster. This is never going to work. There are several reasons why, but you aspire to be young engineers. Engineers don't work on the floor in the dirt. Engineers don't wear open-toed shoes when they're working in the workshop. Engineers work in clean conditions. You're not fixing auto rickshaws on the side of the road. Um, but that's, that's not what you aspire to do. Okay. I'm saying real engineers don't design on the floor with a stick of chalk. And apart from the inevitable accuracies, starting the design on the floor critically comp compromises the suspension load paths, more of which I'll talk about later. And as I've said, real engineers don't work in the dirt. But, you know, think about your presentation. Okay. To keep your chassis design simple, light and stiff, all of the forces should be reacted into a node in the chassis. A node in a space frame chassis is simply 
at the apex of a triangle or a pyramid. You do not want to load the members, the elements of the chassis in bending or in torsion. All the loads should be fed into compression or extension of the, of, of the members of the tube. Several forces can be reacted at the same node, steering and suspension or engine mountain brakes or various things. So it makes sense for your design to have as few nodes as possible. In other words, again, we're simplifying the design. If you're thinking that this means that, oh, sort of sitting down and brainstorming how we're gonna do that. Yep, you're right. Okay. Uh, some of the best designers in the world have fallen for the trap that we're just talking about. This is a Lotus Mark VIII chassis from the 1950s designed by the, the, the famous Colin Chapman, who is revered as one of the greatest race car designers of all time. So he built this simple, stiff, fully triangulated chassis. But how the heck do you put stuff? How do you, how do you mount an engine in this chassis? How do you mount a seat, a steering column? How do you mount suspension on it? It's literally a disaster because by the time this car got to the track, it had so many brackets and, and appendages and extra bits welded on and stuff. You know, it, it was it was a mess. It started off extremely pure and simple because he had this great idea of a of a stiff, light, pure chassis, and it ends up being just a disaster. And here we have a Formula student chassis that's exactly the same. Uh, you know, it's not the same obviously as the Lotus chassis because different car, different design, but it still has the same fundamental errors. I mean, how do you put an engine into that car or an electric motor and, and battery pack? How do you put suspension on that car? How do you put a driver in that car? Where does the fuel tank go? Where does the radiator go if you're running a cooling system? Um, you know, it, wrong way, started on the wrong foot. Okay, told me here about the sort of sketches that you should be doing uh, at the early design stages. We have here, uh, obviously, uh, um, whoops, this thing keeps jumping ahead on me. We have here like a, a chassis, it doesn't really matter what it is. A wheel out here, and I've drawn, let's oh, done it again. We've drawn in here the bottom suspension link. And I've drawn that suspension link parallel to the ground and actually try and make it as long as possible. The reasons for this is firstly, have a look at the load path. In the case, you know, when you when the car drives around a corner, there's a, a, a lateral force pushing the chassis outwards out this way, and the reaction force from the road is pushing the wheel in that way. So this suspension component actually goes into compression. Now, if we make the flat bottom chassis that we saw, and we attempt to have you know 30 or 40 millimeters of ground clearance, that means the bottom of the chassis is gonna be very close to the ground. And if we try to feed the suspension load into the node, which is now too low, that suspension component is no longer parallel to the ground. It's no longer a, a, a pure load path. So what's happening, you can see, is that the force will try to drive the chassis down. Um, the, suspension geometry as it rolls will actually shorten the distance between here and the car, which introduces scrub and the tires don't grip very well. So you've, you've sacrificed grip. So obviously at the ends of the car where the suspension bolts on, you need to look at where are my suspension forces going to go into the car. The upper link, when you go to put an upper link in, that can go really anyway, that's not the one that's doing all the work. The, the, the bottom suspension link is the one that does all the work. The bottom one, although it should go into a node, it's not quite as important because the, the forces are much lighter. Okay. So you should end up probably with a chassis like this, where you've got your 30 to 40 millimeters of ground clearance under the bottom of the chassis, under the driver's seat, um, you know, under the driver's backside to get the driver as low as possible but the chassis is raised at each end in order to give you suspension pickup points that give you 
proper load path into the chassis. Now, please note, this is not a chassis design. Don't go copying this and say, oh, this is Pat, what Pat said we have to do. Um, it's simply a sketch that should maybe give you some ideas. Hang on while I go through my notes here, make sure I'm, make sure I'm up to date. Oops. I've been through this so many times, I know what the notes actually say, but uh, yep, so okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, oh, the next one just shows that I've gone back to the same picture. I've said to put your top suspension link in wherever it goes from the top of your upright. Uh, your suspension experts will talk about kinematics and roll centers and all that. Roll centers don't matter. They just, if the bottom link is parallel to the ground, the roll center will automatically fall in a suitable place. Your instant center, your virtual swing axle inch should be two to three track widths. So, you know, in other words, that pivot point should be out off the side of the picture somewhere. And then you can adjust the amount of camber gain or camber change that you want as the suspension works by adjusting the length of this top link. Obviously a shorter link will give you more top, uh, more gain, a longer link will give you less. Now, the rules of Formula Barat require that you have 50 millimeters of suspension travel, 25 millimeters in bump, 25 millimeters in droop. That's all you need. You know, there, there, there is no reason why you should design a suspension system that gives you 70 or 80 millimeters of suspension travel uh, this is not a Baja buggy that we're not riding off road. We're running on relatively smooth tracks, even though the track we run Barata is, is a bit bumpy, but, but that's okay. So you have to ask yourself when you're doing this suspension design, how much change in camber and stuff are you going to get in only 50 millimeters of wheel travel? Most of the time that we see camber errors, which is destroying the tire and destroying the grip, it's coming from compliance in the structure or compliance in the suspension or even compliance in the wheel. Uh, you know, so that, you know, I recall a, a, a team, I showed them a photograph of their outside rear wheel, loaded rear wheel driving off a corner and it was in significant positive camber, which is tearing up the tire and, and you know, ruining the grip and you know, making the car difficult to drive. And the designer said, no, that's not possible. That's just something that's come up with a camera, you know, so the shutter or whatever is shown. But it was possible. And we later discovered that the wheel center was actually flexing. And you know how we found out that? Because it broke. There were cracks around where the, where the studs attached to the hub and it actually broke. So they were in positive camber and the compositive camber wasn't related to their suspension kinematics where the, the designer swore blue and black that it couldn't happen. But, you know, it was actually the wheel was flexing and eventually it broke. Uh, so they DNF the event and it spoiled their event. Okay. Now, use a direct acting suspension system. I want you to gather up all your push rods, your pull rods, your bell cranks and all that nonsense and drop them in the bin. You have no money, you have no time. If you're going to reuse a push rod suspension or a pull rod suspension system, it means you're going to have to buy eight extra rod ends. You have to make four extra push rods or pull rods. Uh, you need an additional node on the chassis where you're going to pivot your bell crank. You have a vector force generated when you're trying to send the force around the corner. Remember, forces don't like to go around corners. So you're going to have to stiffen up where that bell crank pivots. Many, many times we see bell cranks pivoted in the middle of an unsupported tube. And that actually is one of the, the major design failures that we actually see. Look, a direct acting suspension has won Formula One World Championships and God knows what else. Okay, it might not be uh, flavor of the month with the expensive teams, but it's simple and easy to do. But it also means that back at the design stage, before you start designing the chassis part, you need to have sorted out your uprights, your suspension links, your suspension 
uh, shock absorber or whatever, and that should just just use something from a um, from a uh, a local motorcycle. Like you don't you don't need. Oh, we should have stopped doing that. Um, you don't need uh, you know Cane Creek or Olin, Olin's shock absorbers or whatever. Okay. We'll move on. Obviously, certain aspects of the chassis design are mandated in the rules. So there, you know, side impact structures and various things, roll hoops and whatnot. It is vitally important that you read, understand these rules, and abide by them. Because if you don't, what's going to happen is you get to the event, the car will fail tech, and you will not be allowed to compete in any dynamic event. So all year you've been looking forward to going to Combator and having a drive in your little formula car. And when you get there, the technical inspectors say, nope, the car does not meet the rules. It cannot be driven on the track. And usually uh, failures of that nature can't be fixed. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a one way street. You, you can't repair them. The most common failure we see is, is the failure to accept one of the templates. Usually it's the template, the, the footwell template that goes down into the footwell uh, because the steering rack or the steering column gets in the way or something. So if you have any questions about that, before you start making any decisions or making any guesses or thinking, oh, I think this is what they mean, please submit a rules request. There are only too happy to, to help you don't be afraid to submit where your design is at that stage. Nobody's going to nobody's going to reveal your secrets, mainly because there are no secrets. I mean, I have now seen thousands and thousands of Formula Student and Formula SAE cars, and there is no solution that I haven't seen. I haven't seen a new design car for years um, because there are only so many solutions you can come up with. Okay, when you're going to make this chassis, the first thing is there is no need for expensive alloy seals. You don't need to buy Reynolds tube or you don't need to buy, you know, 4130, ASA 4130 chrome moly tube. You know, you might read on, on for, forums and various places that that's what teams use overseas. You don't need to do that. Um, ordinary 1018, 1020, 1025, uh, mild steel tube is perfectly acceptable. It's just as strong uh, and although it might be marginally heavier because you can't get the thin wall sections that you can get in chrome moly steel, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, you know, the car might be two kilos heavier. Big deal. You can TIG weld, a fusion weld, or even braze the chassis to be acceptable. Electric arc welding is not acceptable. If a car is delivered to the event or presented at the event to the technical inspectors and the chassis has been arc welded, stick welded, it will be immediately rejected at, at the scrutiny and will not be allowed to compete. That's, sorry, but that's that's the way it is. That's not acceptable. My uh, my advice would be to to uh, to MIG weld the chassis that's using a, a wire welder, MIG wire welder, as used by all the panel beaters and whatever. MIG welders are relatively cheap these days, wire welders. Uh, they don't require uh, a great deal of expertise. You know, your welders can, can practice a bit. TIG welding is very difficult. Fusion welding, it's easy to blow holes in the chassis. And brazing... Uh, Although race cars have been braced for many years, generally it's fair to say that the only person that knows that the braze joint is a good joint is the guy who actually did it. Uh, it's difficult; you can't you can't see whether it's a, whether it's a good joint or not. But again, as I said, electric arc welding, which we have seen, not acceptable. Don't do it. It you will be well. Uh, arc welding in the chassis. There may be some parts of the of the car that you may arc weld. Like, for instance, it might be necessary 
uh, to arc weld uh, some component because it's because it's heavy and heavy metal or whatever. Um, I can remember on a race car that I built years ago having to arc weld steering arms onto the front suspension upright, but that was an iron suspension upright and an iron steering arm. Okay. One of the problems with 4130 and similar steels is the necessity to normalize them after they've been welded. So even though this weld looks like quite a nice weld, you can see that it's actually fractured in the heat affected zone right beside the weld. To avoid that happening, the, the chassis needed or the joints needed to be heat treated or, or normalized whilst in service. So that's another complication that you don't need. This doesn't happen with ordinary carbon steel, mild steel tube that you use. Okay. Just for fun, that's a weld from a 16 year old high school student in Queensland. It's a TIG weld, a tungsten inert gas, it's very difficult. But uh, I just included it here to show you that, yep, it can be done. I mean, that is artistry, that's absolutely beautiful. I don't, ex I don't expect to see welds of that caliber on Formula student cars in India. Okay, what are the advantages of using 1020 steel or 1020, 1018, 1025? Um, first of all, it's freely available and it's much cheaper than the high strength steels. It doesn't require the special welding techniques. As I said, it can be welded effectively with a simple MIG wire welder and it doesn't require that post weld normalization. Um, you know, it's, as I said, it's the, it's the type of welding that panel meters use when they repair cars in the, in the panel shop. Very in, industry-wide standard. The disadvantages of 20, 1020 steel, and this is something that I've seen um, in India particularly. Um, 1020 steel is not available in the thin wall sizes that you can get with chrome moly steel. I've mentioned that. So it may be that some parts of the car end up a little bit heavier. But remember that the rules require a minimum wall thickness of most parts of the car. So even if you are going to use the, the high strength alloy steels, you'd still have to use thick wall tubes. So there's no weight saving at all. The quality of the tube can be questionable if bought from an unscrupulous vendor. Now I have actually seen this in India. Hi, Pat. I believe we've lost you. You could never even drive it. It was just, uh, it was just a disaster. Hi, Go. Pat. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I believe we lost you for the last one minute. Oh. Yeah. Apologies. It just went blank for a minute or so. Okay. Uh, where do you remember where I was? You were. Uh, right before you had finished about uh, unscrupulous uh, uh okay uh, yeah okay that's the yeah. last word i remember <laughs> okay that's that's all right so we're talking about uh unscrupulous you know unfortunately some of the people that you have to deal with in the world um i won't say in india particularly but yeah i won't make any comment about that there are unscrupulous people out there who may sell you some product which is not what it's supposed to be. Be careful, be careful. Um, the story I told was about a team that had actually arrived with a car made from totally unsuitable uh, material, but they had a document from the vendor that they bought it from saying that the steel was actually something else and it wasn't. So that car failed tech, it was never going to pass tech, could never be driven just a complete disaster for the students, probably for no fault of their own. You know, maybe they were just a bit, yeah, they, they were just a bit naive. Okay. Now, what about square tube? We don't see many 
Formula student cars fabricated from square section or rectangular section tube. But here we have a very successful real race car, and you can see that it's been fabricated from square section tube. You can also see that it has direct acting suspension. This car, and, and, and lots more like it, has actually won international championships all over the world. Now, what are the advantages or disadvantages of square tube? Well, you can buy square and rectangular tube in both 4130 and, and 1020s tube. Firstly, it is far easier to cut, to fit, and to fabricate. Uh, it has a higher resistance to bending than round tube. It's far easier to fit brackets and attachments, and it's far easier to put panels on. Those panels can be stress panels. You may well decide to, to glue and rivet uh, aluminum sheet panels on the floor or the sides or whatever, which will stiffen up the chassis. Uh, why don't teams use it? Well, because it's heavier. You know, any given piece of tube, a, a, a meter of uh, a meter of uh, one inch square section tube, will weigh about twenty percent more than a meter of round tube. Mainly because the diameter is oh, sorry, the the circumference of this of the the tube is. Uh, one inch times pi for round tube and one inch times four for square section tube. So basically you've got, you know, 3.15 versus four. Uh, that's, but the benefits mean that the chassis can be built far quicker, far more accurately. It's much easier to get your joints. You don't need the, the uh, you know, the, the, the fish, the, fish mouth joints to, to make to make the joints work pr properly when you're working with round tube. Uh, square tube, it doesn't take torsional loads very well. It will it will twist more than that, more than round tube, but it actually takes bending loads much better than round tube. So if you keep those two things in mind at the design stage, you think, okay, I am not going to put torsional loads into the chassis, into the into the tube members. I will only load it in bending. Uh, the other thing is you have to take care to avoid it panting because it's got flat panels. If you weld something to the flat panel and apply a force to it, it may actually flex and, and be a little compliant. Uh, I've said square tube does not dissipate local loads as well as round tube. That, that's what I'm talking about. And square tube is difficult to bend, but you shouldn't be bending it anyway. You should be using straight tubes in, in your chassis. Uh, so if we consider the intent of this presentation, we're talking about advice for teams who don't have much money. I would suggest that you build a simple space frame chassis using square section tube where practical and uh, don't design or try to build that chassis until you know all of the forces that you want to feed into it so that you can keep your your um, your load paths pure and straight, keep the car simple and, and light. And believe it or not, that could actually improve. Uh, hi, Pat. I believe we lost you again. Uh, or the screen froze for a bit. I invariably choose. Hang on, I've got a message here saying my internet connection is unstable. Yeah, Pat, we lost you when you started the slide, uh, the chassis space frame, one, the one that you just shared. 
Uh, this one. Yeah, we lost you when you just started this. Okay. Um, well, that's that's important because what I was recommending was that if the team are you know budget restricted, build a simple, straightforward space frame chassis using square section tube where practical. Um, make sure that it's designed so that the load paths are, are pure and straight. So in other words, ensure, collect all of your suspension designs and your engine mounts and your steering geometry and all those other things. All those things get collected together first and then incorporate them into, into the chassis. In, in, a, in a design program, a CAD program, you're going to populate a, a, a galaxy of, of, of points. And realistically, it almost becomes a matter of join the dots. Uh, you know, there are things, you know, you have to fit the driver, you know, the 95th percentile, 25th or 5th percentile female. Uh, you have to have minimum uh, dimension between the front bulkhead and the steering wheel. Uh, Percy's got to fit, you know, you've got to fit your engines. All those things that have to be ad adapted or accepted, the chassis. And you also have to have a, a good understanding of how the forces will be reacted, you know, back to Newton's F equals MA thing. Uh, then the chassis, especially if you make this uh, from square section, the chassis can actually build, be built very quickly, like for, literally within a week, uh, put it all together. So, you know, starting off and trying to build the chassis first and then make everything fit, it, it just really isn't going to work. Okay. Wheels and tires. A cash strap team, a team with, with budgetary constraints in India, invariably choose to use ordinary street tires. This choice means that they are at a disadvantage in all of the dynamic events. Proper race tires will generate so much more grip that it just isn't funny. Not only do they generate more grip, but they also weigh less. So if you consider that the wheels are like four uh, gyroscopes mounted on each corner of the car, and those gyroscopes are big and heavy road tires, uh, then it takes more energy to accelerate them. It takes more energy to turn them. Remember gyroscopes, gyroscopic precession, the forces want to travel in the same straight direction. Uh, and also, of course, it takes more energy to stop them. So, it, you know, it affects all the dynamic aspects of the car on the track. You have to accept that. Um, but all's not lost. And we can make the best of such a compromised situation. You know, we, but you must understand that you're not going to come to the event with road tires and win any dynamic event. Okay, the disadvantages of street tires, you've got much lower grip, much higher weight, but the advantages are lower cost, maybe nothing. You know, you can perhaps persuade a sponsor to give you some wheels and tires. Um, a good source of wheels and tires might be from a dealership where somebody has ordered a car and they've, uh, they have uh, asked to have it fitted from you with alloy wheels and low profile tires or something, what's going to happen to steel wheels and tires that came off that car? Maybe, maybe you could buy them at the right price or maybe you can convince a dealer to give them to you. Okay, as I said, the advantages are lower cost and better availability. Always go to the wreckers. Um, and there's no need for extra wet tires because these tires have a uh, have a, a tread pattern and so we work in the wet, you don't need to have a second set of wheels and tires in case it rains. Now I know it's probably not gonna rain in Combatour in January. However, it could. And if it does, you're going to, if the track is declared wet, you're going to have to have wet weather tires. Okay. Problem with street tires is that they're designed for cars that are much heavier than the, than for the student cars, you know, like a, even a Tata Nano is going to weigh four or five times more than a Formula student car. So the sidewall stiffness is much too stiff. 
so the tires don't have good compliance to, to follow the track. They're also designed to last for, for many years and you know, designed to go 25,000 or, or more kilometers. Um, and they're designed for use in all conditions, like on dirt roads, uh, broken tarmac, motorways, high speed, low speed in fields. So they're hugely compromised. Uh, to offset the sidewall stiffness, you should set the pressures very low. Probably about 10 PSI or 70 kilopascals is probably a good starting point. And while I'm on the topic, make sure that the compressor is pumping dry air. Make sure the compressor is drained regularly and use a water trap if needs be. It's actually humidity in the air in the compressor that actually causes pressure changes as the tire warms up on the track. So if you have wet air in the tire and you go out with 10 PSI and do four or five laps, you're probably gonna have 15 or 20 PSI in the tire because the, the steam boils off and up goes the pressure and, uh, and down goes the grip um, because the, the tire is now so stiff in the sidewall that it's actually pattering across the track rather than trying to stay in contact with the track and give you limited but some grip. Okay, now I'll talk about the engine. You know, Formula Barat is not a power competition. Uh, studying the data from even the fast team shows that they're only on full throttle, 100% throttle around about, well, maybe 15% of the lap. Uh, the rest of the time it's on a closed throttle. Well, it's on a closed throttle. Yeah. Okay, if you're on limited grip street tires, this is even more of a case because obviously you can't accelerate from a corner as early and you can't hold full power as long because you've got to brake earlier when you come to the end of the straight. So bluntly, any engine will do. Uh, well, I said maybe not that one. That, that's just a a drawing of an old vintage motorcycle engine. You wouldn't run that. Okay, the cheapest engine available in India is the Royal Enfield 350 or 500 single. The engine is heavy and being air cooled, it's very difficult to accommodate in the chassis whilst ensuring adequate cooling airflow. In the early days of Indian Formula student events, we saw many teams use these Royal Enfield engines, but not very successfully. The later engines are fuel injected, which helps a little bit. Uh, the carburetor engines, yeah, okay. Uh, the major problem with them, of course, was trying to get cooling airflow across the cylinder to try to keep the engine cool uh, when the engine was actually situated behind the firewall behind the driver. It was very difficult to get airflow. Uh, a solution to that that we could see, but we haven't is to build a car with the engine beside the driver. Now, it's no more difficult to do that than to build a standard rear engine car. And in fact, if a team turned up with a car like that and justified to the judges why they did it, they'd score some points for that. You know, in this case, this, this car is fitted with a, an Aprilia V-twin, but the engine doesn't matter. That's a, 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 a car from Belgium drawing from a car from Belgium. Now, if you think that it might not be competitive, and remember, you're not gonna be competitive anyway, but you're wrong because that car with the engine mounted beside the driver actually won FSAE West the last time they ran at the end of 2018. Uh, that's uh, from Texas A&M uh, University. It has a single cylinder engine mounted over here Oops, yeah, in, under this cover, sit beside the driver. Um, it gives you, you know, it reduces the polar moment of inertia, makes the car easier to turn. Um, a lot of good reasons why you should do that. Now, Pat's not saying that you should build a car like this. What Pat is saying is that there are more ways to skin a cat. There are different ways to do things. And this would be a very suitable solution if you're forced to use a Royal Enfield or any other air-cooled engine, um, you know, so that you can have airflow that comes down. Uh, obviously, a huge wing like this isn't going to help because that'll block the airflow to the engine, but you're not going to run wings on your car anyway. 
I'll thump you if you do. Okay. Most popular engine in Formula Barra these days is the KTM 390. It's a lovely little engine. You know, it's uh, it's powerful. It's not cheap, and it's not easy to adapt to the rules. Many teams, especially in the early days, found that it was difficult to make it run properly. Um, the throttle body is too big and also houses the fuel injector. Um, fitting a suitable smaller throttle body is a significant engineering exercise. Now, I'll explain to you what I'm talking about here. The fuel injected engine has a throttle with a sensor on the side of it. That's the throttle position sensor. And that sensor tells the ECU, the engine control unit, how much the throttle has been opened so that the ECU can send the right amount of fuel to the fuel injector to meet the engine's needs. But when you put a 20 millimeter restrictor in the induction system, what happens is that once the throttle, the, the throttle, uh, throttle body of these is about 47 millimeters of diameter. So once the throttle gets to about one third open, all the air that can flow through the through the uh, throttle body saturates the, the restrictor. The restrictor can't pass any more air. And if you keep opening the throttle, the ECU doesn't know this. So the ECU just keeps adding more fuel. Uh, and the result is the car drowns in fuel. It can be that the extra fuel can wash the oil away from the cylinders and we have had engine failures. The other thing is that the ECU has a uh, controls the ignition timing in the engine. And so if the ignition timing is not correct, it's very easy to knock a hole in a piston in one of these. These engines run very high compression ratio, so they need to be looked after very carefully. They also have flyby wear throttle, which means that the, the twist grip on the motorcycle is a sensor uh, that tells the ECU how much throttle the, the rider wants, and then the ECU opens that throttle. So it's kind of a closed loop system. And of course, you can't do that on the, on the car either. So you need to, to re-engineer it. So it is a, technically quite a difficult engine to adapt. But having said that, it's light, it's powerful, it's easily available. Uh, there is a fair amount of uh, um, knowledge. The worst part of it is that the Standard ECU cannot be re-educated. It can't be reflashed or reprogrammed. So you either need a programmable ECU, and that needs access to a dynamometer to be able to set that up so the engine runs properly and safely, or there is such a thing as a, a piggyback ECU, which is like a, a an interrupter, a little ECU that goes between the sensors and the, and the main ECU, which can tune the engine after a fashion. But uh, it, it's, uh, if, if you decide to run a, a, a KTM engine, you need to do your research before you, uh, before, you, before you proceed. Okay, final drive. Another very expensive component is uh, seen as the differential. You know, everybody looks and they think, oh, you know, those... Uh, those uh, uh, Drexler differentials from Germany, they're, they're wonderful, and they are. Uh, they're a Salisbury type limited slip differential. They probably cost in US dollars about about three or 4,000 US dollars. I don't know what that comes to in rupees, but a lot of rupees. Uh, you could use a standard open differential from a streetcar. Uh, you know, you come out of a, a little uh, Tata or, or Maruti or whatever. The problem with an open differential is that uh, it sends the torque to the wheel with the least grip. So you're going to have wheel spin issues on the track and, and that's going to slow you down. Limited slip differentials like the Torsen that I've drawn pictures there, that used to be the flavor of the month in formula, not so much these days. Uh, they're very expensive and they're difficult to maintain. But of course there is another option and the other option is to use a spool drive. Now a spool is simply a solid shaft that takes the place of the differential. In other words, you've got a solid drive. Okay. Now, 
you might think, oh, how can you drive it if it's got no differential? It's just one to go straight ahead in the corners. Well, that's not the case. Some of the very fastest cars in the world are currently using spool drives. Cars racing at the Indianapolis 500 use a spool drive. Many of the cars that run at the Le Mans 24 hour race run a spool drive. The Australian V8 supercars all use a spool. So obviously it can be done. And it's done by adjusting the suspension and training the drivers. And in fact, once the car has been adjusted to drive well with a spool, it's easy to drive very fast, it's fun, and it's very safe. Uh, there are other advantages. It means that you can safely use a single inboard rear brake. Now, that means that because you're gonna use a single brake, it needs to be bigger than the normal rear brakes that you would use. So in fact, you can actually use the same brake, disc and caliper as you're using on the front of the car. So your logistics become much easier. The brake torque, which is very significant, can actually be fed into the structure rather than feeding it into the chassis via the suspension links. So it can, means you can have a, a lighter or a, you know, less complica complex load parts from your suspension into the chassis because you're not reacting brake forces. Uh, the brake forces and the drive forces are all being reacted through, whoops, through this structure here, which is feeding it directly into the chassis. Another thing you must understand when you're starting to talk about setting out your load parts. There's a spool fitted to a car. In this one, it's got dual brakes, but you can see it's a very simple, so, whoops, done it again. Yeah, so there, here's the drive over here. Here's the spool, just carried in a, in a pillow block bearing, driving the, uh, driving the axles. Easy solution. Okay, here's some geometry suggestions. You need somewhere to start, okay, on, on your street car. So I'm talking here about at the front of the car, you probably need to have a starting point and put these in as a design starting point so that when you start adjusting things, you don't start running out of adjustment because you set the car, for instance, for zero camber. And when you try to adjust for negative camber, now you've run out of adjustment. If you set the car for two degrees of negative camber, you can adjust back towards positive if you wish, or down towards more negative if you wish. But I'm suggesting for the front of the car, you should have about two degrees of negative camber, about five degrees of positive camber, your KPI or steering axis inclination, wherever it works out, like whatever, whatever happens when you design your car. The scrub radius, the, 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 the suspension guys will understand that the scrub radius if you're using a spool, should be about 75 millimeters. One of the things that makes the spool work is having some scrub radius at the front. If you're using a proper differential, maybe 25 millimeters might be a better scrub radius. Your front toe should be about three millimeters of toe out and your Ackerman should be 100% positive. Don't get lost involved in some Ackerman, anti-Ackerman discussion. Just use a standard Ackerman where the extension of the steering arms intersect in the middle of the rear axle, 100% Ackerman. And you can remember it's the Ackerman is not the important thing. It's the effect of Ackerman. That's to say the change in the toe as you steer the car, which is important. So you can adjust that by adjusting the static toe. If you want more toe out on the turns, well, you just give the car more toe out. You know, uh, excessive toe People will argue, oh, it'll slow the car down the straight. So where's this straight? We don't have straights of any importance in formula because we don't let you go fast enough. That's part of the design of the track. So if you have to run, you know, uh, uh, six millimeters or eight millimeters of toe out or toe in, yeah, that's what you do. This is, this is why you need to get the car finished and test and train your drivers at least a month before you ship the car to the event. Okay, at the back of the car, use less camber at the back of the car because, um, you know, dri drive, you want to drive better. 
nil scrub. Okay, so you want to try aim if you possibly can for nil scrub and three millimeters of toe in. So you have three millimeters toe out of the front, three millimeters toe in at the rear. Don't tow the rear of the car out. Rear of the car towed out will be very unstable under brakes and the car, the car will spin very easily. Um, one of the major issues that we see talking about rear toe is the design of the rear suspension allow, allowing uh, compliance steer at the rear of the car. You need to really structure a good stiff parallelogram type suspension on either the upper or lower control arms to uh, to wipe out the possibility of the car actually steering from compliance or actually steering from from uh, roll steer or or uh, bump steer you know you it, it's not such a huge issue at the front of the car because the driver's got a device connected to it so he can kind of correct might not be comfortable but he can he can correct it but at the rear of the car you're just a passenger if the if the rear of the car starts to tow out the car will oversteer like crazy and there's nothing the driver can do about that if it tows in the car will understeer like crazy and there's nothing the driver can do do about that uh right wings seriously if the team is cash strapped don't even consider fitting wings you know unless unless the wings can be done really well and I don't just mean the construction and the structure of the wings being done really well, but also the understanding of the aerodynamic principles. Uh, you know, a, a Formula student car has a very small area of real estate. It's very difficult to get an effective wing package that generates any usable amount of downforce at the low speeds that you're traveling at. I mean, we're talking about, you know, corners at 20 kilometers an hour. And on your street tires, your cornering speeds are going to be slow. Uh, so honestly, at this stage, don't even consider it. Now, you're probably going to have, have some team members say, oh, yeah, yeah, you've got to have wings on it because Formula One cars have wings. Well, you're not building a Formula One car. You're building a Formula Student car. Okay. Back, I said I'd talk about this. This is the time management thing. The team leader must manage the team with an iron fist. You know, there he is with a big whip. Once the design is frozen, you got to stick with it, okay? One truth is that it's not what you don't know at the beginning of the project. It's what you don't know that you don't know. Uh, so you're making decisions based on a faulty knowledge base. And as you start to work on the car and things start to become clear, work on the design, and things start to become clear, you start to realize that, oh, we made a decision there which was based on, on false uh, false intelligence, uh, stick with it. If you stop and start again, you're going to miss your deadlines. And you know, the thing is, get the car finished, warts and all, get the car finished, get it to the track, test it. And it is amazing what you can adjust out of the car once you're testing and once you're, once, you know, once you're on the track and you understand what's what's actually happening. Okay, the car represents the best efforts of your team and you should be proud of it. So please present it in a way that reflects your pride. We see so many dirty, scruffy, unfinished cars, cars that the judges don't want to touch because they're afraid they'll catch botulism or something. The team may be cash strapped. You may not have much money, but rags and elbow grease and a little bit of paint, that costs nothing. Don't insult the judges and the organizers by presenting a dirty, slovenly car. That, you know, be proud of it. Like it's, it, You've worked for a whole year to present this thing, so make sure that it looks pretty. Yeah. Now, at this point, that's probably as much as I need to say at this stage, and we can enter some discussion and I'll take questions. Okay, great. Uh, Pat, uh, we do have a few starter questions. If you uh, look at the Excel that I shared with you, I'm just yes. going to keep adding more questions to it as they come along. Yeah. So, please, 
please do that, Kathy, and uh, I will. Where was the Excel sheet? Uh, da, 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 da. I must have closed it. That's all right. I'll, oh. uh, there you go. Yeah, there it is. Okie doke. I'll refresh that. Oh, there, there. Got it. Yeah. Okay, sir, will all the teams come to win the event? Nitesh, if you haven't got the wherewithal to do it, if you haven't got the experience, I'm sorry, but you're dreaming. Honestly, you must, must be realistic. You know, that's like saying, oh, I'm going to go fight uh, Mike Tyson and, and I, I think I can beat him. Like, ain't going to happen. You might get him worried in the first round because he might think he's killed you, but that's as far as it's going to go. So, Nitesh, I'm sorry, but you must be realistic. That's unrealistic expectations is, is a downfall. I'm sorry, but you must readjust your expectations. If you belong to a team that's got the ability to do that, have got the ability and, the, and the, the, the experience and the people and the money and time, sure, expect to win it. I wouldn't expect anything less. But if you're a new team that's cash strapped and you're just learning about this, you haven't got a chance. Okay. Uh, what's the disadvantage with stick welding? Why is it unacceptable? Um, stick welding is more suitable for, uh, for heavy uh, materials like welding big stuff together. It's murder on thin wall tubing. It, you know, it blows holes. It's ugly. It's, it is, and it's not good engineering practice. We expect from, uh, from young engineers that they employ good engineering practices. So, sorry, no stick welding. Uh, sir, you said alloy wheels are much heavier than steel wheels. In the presentation, it said steel wheels are heavier. Uh, no, I was talking about the tires being heavier. Look, racing steel wheels, uh, ra sorry, racing alloy wheels, if, you know, uh, special lightweight magnesium wheels, certainly they're light, but the alloy wheels that come off production cars and the alloy wheels that people buy as, uh, as accessories to fit to production cars, they're heavy as hell. Honestly, you cannot believe how heavy they are. But an ordinary steel wheel, um, because it's just a stamping of basically two, two stamp, there's the, the diaphragm in the middle that, and, and the rim, they are much, much lighter. Believe me, much lighter. It's actually the tires that are much heavier. That's, and mostly these days, the tires are going to be steel belted radio ply tires. That means they have a steel belt around the periphery. So you've got a heavy, around the outside periphery, which increases their rotational inertia. But if, if you're stuck to running on, on uh, road tires, well, unfortunately, that's something you've got to learn to live with. Okay. What if we use a CVT transmission? Where are you going to get a CVT transmission from? What engine are you going to use with a CVT transmission? I would suggest to you that a CVT transmission is a potential benefit. It means you can run the engine at fairly constant RPM whilst the road speed of the vehicle changes. But it adds a significant level of complexity to your design and build. Um, so again, if you're an experienced team and you, you know what you're doing, the other thing to remember is that most engines that you're going to run already come with a clutch and transmission. So why would you have two clutches and, trans two clutches and transmissions? Um, yeah, CVT, I've got no, no problem with transmission with CVT if, if you can justify it. Of course, the very first question the judge is going to ask you is why? Why? Okay, what kind of spool design is better, solid or hollow? <laughs> Whatever you design, uh, it's going to lock the wheels together. There will be no differential action across the back axle. If you, make, if you fabricate one from steel tube or you turn one from aluminium, or in fact, it, it, could, only, it could be simply a, a hub uh, with the disc brake on one side and the sprocket on the other side, whatever. There is no better. Uh, how did the team which won with the UC engine decide with the weight imbalance? What weight imbalance? The car is asymmetric. They move the driver across to one side to balance the car. So it still has uh, the co correct corner weights. Uh, if you have a look at any uh, uh, production go-kart, 
you'll find that the driver is offset because the engine is set beside the driver. Uh, you know, you can you balance the car by moving the driver over. Nobody said that the driver has to sit on the center line of the car. There's no rule for that. Uh, what's the next one? Uh, we're kind of stuck with steering because we don't have mirrors that can help us. Uh, okay, maybe any tips apart from what you've been... Look, I think we need to do uh, another presentation. I'll organize with Kathy, do another presentation where I talk about steering and, and suspension. Because if I start to talk about it now, we'll go on for hours. And in less than an hour, I have another presentation I've got to do for Hungary. So I can't be here all night. I can be here for another half hour or so. But if we start talking about suspension and steering, um, I'd suggest, you know, get yourself onto, uh, onto Google and start looking at pictures. Okay, what, do we, what makes a good upright? Okay, it's got to be stiff. Uh, it's got to be geometrically suitable. Um, you know, what makes a good upright? A good upright. I don't need. I, what's the significance of reducing roll center migration? We're touching on a sore spot. Roll centers and roll axis and all of that nonsense is something that was dreamed up years ago by old druids and, and witch doctors. And realistically, is only a starting point for your design. Now, I suggested to you earlier this that you should mount your bottom suspension arms, your bottom suspension links, parallel to the ground and as long as practical. If you do that, your roll center is now going to be somewhere between the bottom of your chassis and the ground. Near enough. Don't even think about it. Just do what I told you and worry about roll centers way down the road. You will find out that when you do your design, it's very easy to figure out actually where your roll center is. But roll center migration, honestly, don't worry about it. It's, it, it, it truly... I know this might sound like heresy, but truly, it doesn't matter very much. Keeping the tire contact patch happy on the road is the most important aspect of good road holding, good handling. Steering and suspension are downsides of our car. We're not able to get points and get our chassis built and designed. I don't understand what you're asking there. Uh, if you follow the, the help I gave you, or the, the suggestion I gave you, um, you should be able to maybe start to, to, to begin to work. Remember that this is, is um, education. And if I tell you something, you know, I haven't really educated you because, you know, you walk away and you forget. But if you work it out yourself, you will remember. That's basically the way, uh, you know, you, you'll find that, you um, if we meet at uh, Formula Barrett next year, you'll find that you'll ask me questions and invariably I will answer that question with another question. Not that I don't want to give you the answer or not that I don't know the answer. And in some cases I don't know the answer, but what I want you to do is I want you to figure it out and I want you to figure out what the answer is because then you remember. Okay, uh, steering, any specific for first time participating teams? Well, basically, this whole presentation was advice for first time. Follow the rules that I've given you in this presentation in the last three quarters of an hour, whatever it's been, and, uh, and you won't go far wrong. Okay. But get your car finished and get it tested. Don't come to the event with an unfinished, disappointed. Like you've worked all year looking forward to the highlight of your year going to be to, to drive your event and to show it to the judges and explain you know, to guys like Pat Clark how clever you've been to design this thing and it doesn't happen because it wasn't finished. That's really the biggest disappointment. Okay, please sir, tell us about steering mechanism. Yeah, I'll tell you about steering mechanism. You've got a wheel, usually about, oh, you know, 300 millimeters in diameter. And when you turn it, it actually makes the wheels turn. I'm not gonna tell you about steering mechanism. That's an open question. What can I tell you about steering mechanism? Um, 
you know what it is, I know what it is. And that's the sort of question that I don't like. Okay, it's, uh, it's you know, please tell you about steering mechanism. Is there anything specific you wanna know about steering mechanism? Then we can address it. So you might want to rephrase your question. Okay, uh, what do the judges expect from you teams? The judges expect an honest attempt. Um, we understand when a new team comes that, you know, we know the struggles they've been through. They've got no money, they've got no experience. They don't know what they don't know. They've been on a learning curve. We understand all that. And we actually give them a little break. When we're judging um, new teams, we go quite easy on them. When we're judging the experienced teams, the teams that have been here and done it a few times, they've been overseas, they've been to the big competitions, they get a much harder question, questioning or quizzing, believe me, than the, than the new teams. But uh, it's, it's a, learning, a learning exercise. And I promise you that as a new team coming to the event, uh, it's incredibly enjoyable. It is unbelievably good fun. I find it, if I've been doing it for years, I've said about 60 events now, um, you know, they're, they're fun, you know, meet great people, great conversations, always learn something. And, uh, and you will meet people who, you know, be friends for the rest of your life. Uh, so enjoy yourself, look for, make sure you come say hello to me when we come to the next, next meeting. Okay, uh, sir, can you please share some more insight into the spool drive or how to recommend some resources? to which we can refer. Yeah, there is a fair amount of stuff about spools on the, uh, on, the, um, on the web. But what makes a spool work is actually in, excuse me while I blow my nose. What makes a spool work is actually related to the suspension geometry at the front of the car, not the back. Okay, if you can imagine, if you have a chair and it's on four legs, and you cut one of the legs off short, now the chair is unstable. If you have a, a, a stool with three legs and you cut one leg short, the stool is still stable. It may be leaning over a little bit, but it's still stable. So what you should be doing with the suspension geometry at the front is attempting to generate um, some uh, diagonal weight transfer and that comes from the amount of caster you're running, the amount of caster trail that you're running, and the amount of scrub radius, and also the amount of acrimony that you may have or may not have, so that when you turn the car into a corner, the inside wheel actually pushes down a little bit, and the outside wheel actually pushes up a little bit. So now we're talking about uh, the vertical deflection of the wheels, we're not talking about the angles the wheels are pointing on the track. What happens of course is now that the the weight changes on the car diagonally so the inside front wheel gets heavy and the uh, that means that the uh, the outside rear wheel gets heavy and the inside rear wheel gets light um, the, the yeah, I got it right yeah so uh, the, the lateral forces will then cause the car to rock over a little bit. And what happens is that the, 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 um, the, the uh, slip angles of the rear tires start to, start to uh, diverge. And the difference in the slip angles of the rear is what actually gives you a differential action that allows the car to turn. So if you follow the, the numbers that I gave you, you've got a good point to start. Then what you do is you get to the track and you start adjusting things like the amount of toe that you've got, toe in, toe out, front and back, um, and get the driver to drive it. Now, if the driver is tentative, so in other words, the driver creeps up to a corner and starts to feed the steering in, the car will push or understeer because the rear wheels locked together will drive it straight ahead. Once the driver starts to get aggressive and understand and arrives at the corner and flicks the car in, and puts his foot on the throttle, then the, you generate the, the slip angles that need to make it happen and the car will turn. Believe me, the car will turn. Major teams like, uh, you know, Monash from Australia, which is one of the top teams in the world. Uh, Auburn, uh, Dr. Peter Jones, who's one of the judges at Barat, his team, they use direct active suspension and a spool drive. Uh, 
the most successful team in recent years is uh, um, the uh, Global Formula 2 GF4. They, they run a spool and run uh, uh, direct acting suspension. So taking these simple solutions uh, to make a simple lighter car, the spool drive is not necessarily a, a going to hurt you in, in performance. But what I do suggest you do is um, uh, do some Google searching for spool drives in Formula SAE spool drives and whatever. Uh, and you'll find a lot of information, a lot of drive. But it is a viable solution, but it absolutely does need the car to be finished early and tested to tune it and to teach the drivers how to drive it. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to drive at speed than a car with a proper differential. You didn't come here to drive around slow. Okay, uh, basic data acquisition systems should you employ. Uh, oh, hang on, tips for the design effect and how to prepare for it. How to prepare for it. Okay, there are no trick questions. There are no set questions. And the judges don't, don't um, the judges don't have a set of, of uh, particular questions that every team has asked. What the design event is going to be, it's going to be a discussion between two sets of engineers. One set are you guys who have designed and built this car, and the other set are the, the, uh, the judges that you're going to try justify your design to. The judges are going to ask you uh, open questions. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. Uh, primarily the why question. Why do you have a spool? So if you have a spool in the car, why do you have a spool? So then you have to justify that decision. Um, a question, an answer like, oh, because Pat told us was a good solution, isn't going to get you any, any points. You need to be able to explain technically why you were able to like, choose a spool over a differential. And an acceptable answer is that we didn't have the budget to uh, to to buy the differential that we wanted. So we knew that a spool was an acceptable solution. So we chose to do that and designed and built the car early in order to get, you know, optimize the, the effect of, of the spool. There is no perfect solution. There's no perfect solution. You know, every, every question. So the questions that the judges are going to ask you is why? And your, uh, your performance in the design event will be how well you are able to uh, to justify your design decisions. Um, you know, that's basically it. it there, there's no trick. Okay, uh, what's the main criteria of design to show? Is he making it lighter, making it strength to handle impact? What impact? What are you going to hit? You know, we limit your speed to um, we limit your speed to about 100 kilometers an hour. And that's probably only at the end of the acceleration event. Uh, we organize the tracks in such a way that it's highly unlikely you're actually going to hit something. If you've designed a good stiff chassis with, uh, with, with good load paths, it's going to accept a fair amount of abuse if you impact it anyway. Uh, obviously, obviously you can't build a car that's potentially going to hurt your driver if, if something does go wrong. But, uh, you know, F equals MA, uh, you know, you have to keep that M down. So keep it alive. Uh, which is a better decision? Keeping the difference between roll center and CG low or using a longer swing arm length? They're not mutually exclusive. You can have a long swing arm length with a low with a low uh, center of gravity and a low roll center. In fact, if you have a long swing arm length and a horizontal lower suspension link, your roll center is going to be pretty low anyway. Uh, but as I said, roll centers and yeah. the swing arm, the swing axis length changes as the suspension works. Uh, so that's that's a variable. The roll center is going to move. That's a variable. As I said, the more important thing is to keep your tire happy at the contact patch. Um, that's what you need to do. 
Uh, Hi, Pat. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I know you are on a tight schedule, uh, so uh, I have limited the questions on the YouTube chat. So I, I you can go ahead with whichever you think would be. Um, oh, okay. Rather than want to, it's it's yeah. completely up to you because I know you're on a time crunch. What did the judges really expect? Entire data analysis from the teams. If you turn up with straight tires, nothing. I mean, there is no data that you can have. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of emphasis is put on teams belonging to the tire testing consortium. It's probably the best five hundred bucks you can spend if you want to understand about tires. Uh, where that comes into uh, into account is when the judge asks the why question about why did you choose that tire. Then you need to have some data to justify. Your, your choice. Any tips on exhaust and intake designs? No. Uh, hello, sir. Where are, when are we starting with the brake session? Not today, another time. Um, or we'll organize that. We'll probably have suspension steering and brakes in a single presentation at some future date. Uh, are we negative roll centers? What's a negative roll center? I suppose you mean a roll center that's below the ground. I told you before, roll centers are black magic. Don't worry about them. If they end up under the ground, they're under the ground. If they end up above the ground, they're above the ground. That's the way it is. Uh, any alternative way to learn vehicle dynamics rather than books? Yeah, experience. Get the car finished early and start testing. Uh, don't have tire data. How can we optimize our dynamic behavior of the car? Testing. What's the important parameter needed by team to design suspension geometry at first, second years? Because we don't have a lot of data. Follow the instructions I gave you earlier in this presentation. Uh, what's better to use in steering, a universal joint or a bevel gear? Obviously, you have to get the rotational motion from the steering wheel down if you're using a steering rack. Of course, there's no rule that says you have to use a steering rack. There are other ways to make cars steer. Um, but uh, uh, what's better? Whatever. Uh, universal joints. If you're using universal joints, remember that uh, uh, their, uh, uh, rota their rotational acceleration changes as they, as they go through their phases. Uh, bevel gear, expensive, heavy, mounted high in the chassis. Quick tip, a good place to find bevel gears is in the, the drive gears in, in a, an angle grinder. Okay, uh, any trusted resources for suspension which is legit knowledgeable and helping in designing new suspension because we couldn't find anything apart from the Milliken book. Yeah, the Milliken book is really heavy going. I do understand that. There is a book um, written by Alan Staniforth, who uh, fortunately no longer with us, unfortunately no longer with us. Uh, he wrote a suspension book, um, but come back. Uh, I'll organize with Kathy to do another presentation that will cover the design of suspension, speaking the language uh, that, that we understand at, at this level. Like, you know, I, I, I refuse to get involved in differential equations and all that black magic because realistically, all we want to do is keep the tires happy. I did a presentation for the Russians a week or two ago, which was actually called Keeping the Tires Happy. And I can do that. I'll just modify it to make it a bit more suitable for what we're doing here. But we can do that, uh, Kathy, anytime you like. You know? Great, thank uh, you. No, no problems. Uh, well, above all the pros and cons, final question of judges is that we actually physically validate and compare the differential drive and the spool drive, any solid use for using a spool drive? Well, yeah, um, a spool drive will, uh, a spool, I, I, look, I've talked enough about spool drives. And drive. If the, the judge will ask why, and once you've done it and you use it and you've worked out how it works, you'll soon figure out how to justify having a spool drive. Uh, so you know, don't for one minute say, oh, Pat said it was okay to use a spool drive. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I am saying is it's an option. If you have, if remember the, the, the name of this presentation, it's advice for cash strapped, advice for budgetarily limited 
uh, teams in India. If you don't have enough money to source a good proper differential, a spool drive is a much cheaper and still acceptably good uh, option. Okay. Uh, I don't need any alternative way to learn. What about keeping toe out at the front and toe in at the rear for stability at higher speed and cornering? Uh, well, I gave you ex uh, uh, a uh, I gave you a figures up. My, my suggestion was to run starting point of three millimeters of toe out at the front and three millimeters of toe in at the rear. The toe in at the rear is for stability. The toe out of the front is to sharpen the, the turn in performance of the car as, as you initiate the uh, generator your moment to, to turn into the corner. Remember that the tire is a big, big flexible blob between the car wheel and the road. So you can actually turn the wheels quite a bit without actually moving the, the tread contact patch at all because the tire flexes. If you have toe out, you already preload the tire. And when you arrive at the corner and you turn in, remember it's the inside front wheel that goes down, raises the pressure and forms the pin around which the rotational uh, motion will happen as the car starts to turn and you have the tire already loaded in that direction. So it just makes for a sharper, sharper turn in. Um, uh, just how to deal with a lack of grip during turning when using a spool other than adjusting the suspension. What else would you adjust? The driver? That's the other thing you have to adjust. Uh, when are we starting the brake session? I've talked about that. Any so I think, Kathy, I think we've covered most of these. Uh, Sorry. Yes, we have. Uh, uh, whatever is in light green over there on the side, where under status, those you have covered. Yeah. It. Okay. Uh, all right. Basically, data acquisition systems. Um, use whatever data acquisition system you can afford. Uh, data acquisition can simply be a man with a stopwatch. Um, what's your opinion of anti-roll bars on formula student suspension? Um, the anti-roll bar is, is a, a, a device that you really should have front and back because that's another tool that you use to adjust the roll stiffness of your car and it's another tool that you'll use to make a spool work. Obviously, if you stiffen up the, the roll stiffness of the car, the weight transfer makes the spool work a little better. So, yep, I'm in favour of putting anti-roll bars on. The other thing is that, uh, you know, a question that we often ask is if you haven't got anti-roll bars, and we say, okay, let's have this situation that you're on the grid ready to go. Whoops, and it starts raining. So you pull your slick tires off and you put your race tires on. How else are you going to adjust the car to make it more suitable for running in the wet conditions? And you want to soften the roll. So the answer would be to soften the, the adjust the front and rear anti roll bars to soften the car up in roll. So, yep, put roll bars on it. Any tips on exhaust and inset? No, I haven't at this point in time. What about keeping toe out? Yeah, we talked about that a second ago. Yeah, I think we've got it all, Kathy. Okay, great. Uh, well, Pat, I believe we've already, uh, we've done an hour and 45 minutes. Um, Whoa! Yes. <laughs> it's been a... Uh, uh, I mean, as usual, we're really happy to always have you on board, whether it's here at the competition as well. And this year, it's kind of unfortunate that we can't meet at uh, Curry. Um, and uh, the students were really engaged during the entire uh, session. So yeah. uh, once again, thank you so much. And yes, we will definitely talk about... Um, uh, yeah. about a future ses session or uh, you mentioned on suspension and brakes specifically keeping, keeping your tires happy yeah. keeping your tires Keep, happy all right yeah we cover suspension and stuff like that. okay so yeah. we'll do that whenever um, you know next week or the week after whenever so, yeah. yeah okay thanks again i'm going because i've got to go get ready for the for the uh, hungarian presentation yeah
Ah, uh, thank you once again. I've got, uh, I've got something to eat first. <laughs> I know, I know, and you need to get some rest as well. To all the participants, thank you for joining in and for your questions. Uh, we will definitely have another session with Pat in the upcoming month or the next month after. And please do not forget to subscribe to our channel to follow more sessions coming up for, further. Pat, have a wonderful evening, whatever's left of your Sunday, and good luck with the upcoming presentation yeah. as well. And and, uh, and I'd like to thank all the all the attendees. You know, you come along and. Listen, you listen to Pat, uh, you might have gathered that I'm a fairly easy person to talk to. So if you come back for the next presentation, whenever we have that, make sure you get your, think about what you want to ask. You know, like I, I know I snapped a little bit at somebody who said, you know, asked a, what I thought was really a bit of a silly question. So think about, think about the questions you place. It, it's a, uh, you know, you don't want to ask open questions. You want questions where there's going to be information in the response. That's true. I also completely oh, agree with that. Okay. Have fun. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Keep safe. Indeed.